It is our last week before we break for our winter holiday. My grade 10 and 11 pupils have worked hard to get to this point, their 11th week of online lessons. Let's make it a good one. I'm so glad to have you with me here. Please make sure that you like the video and subscribe to the Mrs. M Teaches English YouTube channel so that as many students as possible can benefit from these lessons. Although my lessons are geared for the IEB curriculum, any students of English should benefit from the content. Today we are going to go over something that we all take for granted, dictionary skills. Why dictionary skills, you might ask? As you can see, it's part of the IEB Subject and Assessment Guidelines document. It can be examined as part of Paper 1 in both Question 5 and Question 6. We all know how to use a dictionary, don't we? Let's do a quick recap. Captain Corelli's Mandolin is one of my favorite novels. It was made into a successful movie starring Nicolas Cage. It tells the story of an Italian soldier in Greece during World War II. The book is renowned for its vocabulary. In the middle of this screen is one of the many famous quotes from the novel about the nature of love. You might have seen this printed on wedding invitations. It's a beautiful apt definition and includes the notion that love is not the promulgation of eternal passion. Great words, if you know what promulgation means. Elsewhere in the novel, you'll come across the word corybantic. That certainly had me reaching for my dictionary. Let's take a look at another word from the novel. The main character, Captain Corelli, says that he specializes in finding new ways to be an anachronism. To understand this, we need to do some research. Most of us would choose one of these three options to look up anachronism, an online dictionary, a standard dictionary in book format, or a thesaurus, which is a dictionary of synonyms. Let's start with an online dictionary. The dictionary.com app is a very useful one to have on your phone. If you typed in anachronism, you'd find this definition on your screen. It will tell you that the word is a noun, and it means someone or something that is not in its historical or chronological time, someone who feels that they are living in the wrong time. A very useful feature on this app is that you can choose to listen to the pronunciation of the word. Or you could use your book dictionary, like this one, My Faithful Oxford Dictionary, or OED as it is referred to in most documents. To find anachronism, I look up the word in its alphabetical order. The two words at the top of the page are the guide words, showing the first and last words on this page, and a branch on the left, and analysis bottom right. The word I am looking for is on the left between these two guide words. At the bottom of the page, you will see some seemingly unrelated words. These are a guide to the phonetics of the words on this page. 
they show us how to pronounce the different sounds. And here is the word I am looking for, offering me a few meanings. I will need to look at the way the word has been used in context and decide which meaning best suits that context. You will see a lot of other information, the parts of speech, the phonetic spelling, and the origin of this word. I might want to find a synonym for the word. In that case, I'd use a thesaurus. The problem here is that my Oxford School Thesaurus is limited and does not have anachronism as one of its head words. I would have to look for a more comprehensive thesaurus or turn to online resources for help. Remember that a thesaurus will only give you synonyms. It will not give all the other information found in dictionaries. Now that I have researched the word, I can make more sense of what this critic wrote about the protagonist of the novel. Captain Corelli specializes in putting himself in uncomfortable positions and scenarios where he is challenged to fit into a world into which he would not normally find himself. Here's a challenge for you. Read the novel and see if you can discover a new English word made up by the author and used only in this novel. If Shakespeare could do it, why not other authors? Let's formalize what we have gone over in the previous slides. We know that words in dictionaries are arranged in alphabetical order. That the word you are looking for is called the head word and that all the information under the head word is called the entry. In this entry, you'll find how to pronounce the word, what it means, how to use it as a different part of speech and where the word comes from. This is what it looks like. You will see a number of abbreviations which are standard in most dictionaries. Word class simply means the part of speech of the word, whether it's a verb or a noun, for example. The derivative of a word refers to any words derived from or made from the original word. Here, handler is a derivative of handle. You can also see how the word is used in a figurative sense and idiomatic usage. For example, to fly off the handle is an idiom meaning to become angry very quickly. This is obviously a figurative meaning. The etymology of a word is its origin. You can see here that our word handle comes from the Old English word handian, which means a hand. Here's another example of an entry for the word metamorphosis. The little squiggles, the punctuation marks that you see above the head word, are called diacritical marks. They show you how to pronounce a word and which syllable should be emphasized. We can see that if we change the noun metamorphosis into an adjective, it becomes metamorphic. The adverb is metamorphically and the verb is metamorphose. The word came into English from Greek, GK, via Latin the capital L.
It is vital that you know the standard abbreviations used in all dictionaries. In my Oxford Dictionary, I will find the list of abbreviations in the front of the book. It's definitely worth your while reading through this list and pausing at any words you might not know. An interesting note on this page, on the bottom right hand side, concerns words that have proprietary status. This happens when we use a brand name as a generic term in a sentence. For example, we hoover our carpet with a vacuum cleaner, whether the vacuum cleaner is made by the Hoover company or not. Just as each good dictionary provides a list of abbreviations, it should also provide a list of the phonetic symbols it uses so that we know how to pronounce the words. This is a fairly standard table of phonetic symbols. These symbols show us how to sound the word. It's an international alphabet, and you should be able to use these symbols for words in any language. If you look at the first two words, back and harm, you will see that the letter A is denoted by two different symbols. This is so that a reader knows to say back, not bark, and harm, not ham. On the right hand side, you'll see the symbol for the sh sound. It looks like an incomplete letter F. If you put a T in front of that symbol, the sound changes from sh to ch. English can appear confusing to its users. Take a look at the words on the left. Every one of them ends with O-U-G-H, but each one is pronounced differently. Have a go. How many did you know? Listen as I say them. Though, through, bow, which is another word for the branch of a tree, cough, hock, which is part of a horse's leg, saw, as in I have a sore throat, and tough. Can you spell the word hiccup in its traditional or British way? It also ends with O-U-G-H. Look it up. What about the second image? Do you know how to pronounce each of these words? Read along with me and see if you get them right. So laid is pronounced like paid, but not said, which is pronounced like bread, but not bead. And bead sounds like lead, but not lead. Also, cough, rough, though, and through do not rhyme with each other, nor do aid and plaid, or vanish and Danish, but pony and baloney do. English is a funny old language, isn't it? Before we continue, let me tell you about two words that I struggled with when I was at school. On the left is a picture of a car that my aunt used to drive. It's a Vauxhall Viscount, or so I thought. In the late 1970s, when I was in high school, mm, a long time ago, two aeroplanes were shot down over Zimbabwe by surface-to-air missiles. I listened to the news reports and realized to my horror that I had been pronouncing Viscount incorrectly. The word is 
Viscount. If I had looked it up in a dictionary, I would have seen that the first vowel is I and the S is silent. Another word that tripped me up the first time that I saw it is this one, A-W-R-Y. It means when things are messy, untidy, not going well. How do you pronounce this word? Look at the phonetic spelling above the cartoon. Yes, it's awry, not ori. If we know where a word comes from, its etymology, it gives us clues as to what the word means and how to spell it. Here's an entry for the word soldier. Now we know that it usually has a military connotation, but where does the word come from? This entry shows us that the first trace is found on a Roman coin, meaning that it started as a Latin word, was taken into Old French, then Anglo-Norman, and then into Middle English. It is really an old word. This slide shows you the history of the English language. The words we use today all come from somewhere on this timeline. You're expected to be able to recognize the abbreviations used in dictionaries that represent these different eras of language. I'm sure you'll be surprised to note that Shakespeare's English is considered early modern English. In terms of history, 400 years ago is not long ago at all. Many of our words are not English at all. Here are a few examples of words from other languages that have been swallowed into the English language. This James Nicholl quote is one of my favorites about the English language. It's a language that shamelessly steals from others. When someone asks you to speak pure English, please remind them that there is no such thing. Well, that's enough theory. Let's see if you can answer some questions. Pause the video and read the entry for fumble and then answer the questions. Are you ready? Jot down the letter of your answers. Question one, the word fumble is A, a noun, B, a verb, C, an adverb, or D, a preposition. Number two, the stressed syllable in this word is A, B, C, or D. Three, fume comes from a Latin word that means A, harmful, B, gas, C, smoke, D, fumus. And four, the meaning of fume in the sentence, the businessman was fuming when his client refused to pay him, is A, to be very angry, B, to exude gas, C, to subject to fumes in order to darken, or D, to be harmful. 
write down just the number and the letter. How did you do? Fumble, question one, is B, a verb? Question two, it's the first syllable that is stressed, fumble. Question three, fume comes from the Latin word that means see, smoke. And question four, if the businessman is fuming, he is said to be a very angry. Let's try another one. Read all the information for hearty. Can you provide a synonym for each use of the word hearty in the provided paragraph? Can you provide an antonym for heartily in the provided sentence? Pause the video and write down your answers. Let's check your answers. In 1A, you could have a warm or enthusiastic welcome. In 1B, a filling or substantial lunch. In 1C, a jovial or warm atmosphere. The antonym for heartily would be either coolly or coldly. You know that everything that we study in English grammar, in English language, must not be studied in isolation. You should apply your knowledge of grammatical concepts to current linguistic and topical events. And this includes looking at dictionaries through the lens of current awareness within the human rights movement. An example of what I mean is the challenge issued by American student Kennedy Mitchum to the compilers of the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. The anti-racism protests after the death of George Floyd prompted Mitchum to review the dictionary definition of the word racism. She feels strongly that in order for this definition of racism to be accurate, it must include a reference to systemic oppression. For Kennedy Mitchum, the entry for racism is incomplete without mention of the social and institutional power that is driven by prejudice. Her argument was convincing enough to result in a change to this dictionary. One voice was all it took to effect a pretty big change. Let no one tell you that you can't make a difference in this world. In this lesson, I refer to the traditional dictionary format. There are many others. These ones that you see on this slide are some of the ones that I use most often. The Scrabble Dictionary has mediated in a number of heated arguments on family games nights. Please try to get hold of copies of these books and page through them. It'll be time far better spent than scrolling through Instagram or Snapchat. This entry comes from the Dictionary of South African English, a fascinating book. I chose this entry as an illustration specifically for my students at St. Patrick's CBC in Kimberley. The word here is the rather rude nyak, which is a South Africanism meaning to beat up somebody. The etymology shows us 
that the first usage in English was in 1910. It also tells us that the modern usage of the word was promulgated by T. Barron in Frontline magazine. This is the same Terry Barron who matriculated from St. Patrick's CBC in the 1960s and went on to become an award-winning journalist and writer. The best English student in the GET phase every year in our school is awarded the Terry Barron Award, named for the man who brought Nyak back into the English language. I am aware that you have sat through this video lesson in order to find out how dictionary skills are examined in your final exams. We'll look at some past papers from the IEB. The first one is from 2008. The paper had various texts related to the Tintin in Congo comic book. This Tintin book is controversial as it depicts colonial stereotypes. Educated white character travels to Africa and interacts with Africans in a manner that can only be described as condescending and racist. This Zapira cartoon is a parody of the original Tintin story. Here we see the then President of the United States, Bill Clinton, speaking down to an African man. In the African's response to Clinton's comment, he uses the word rapturous in his verbal put down. In the question, candidates are asked to consider the dictionary definition of the word rapturous and its etymology, and to comment on how this information adds to the meaning of the word as it is used in this particular context. In 2010, dictionary skills were examined in a different way. Candidates were asked to study this pick and pay PSA, public service announcement, asking for customer cooperation in reducing the amount of plastic we use and throw away. The picture is of a dinosaur made out of plastic bags. Pause the video and read the question. You're given a dictionary entry for dinosaur. The question asks what the words Tyrannosaurus rex mean and how you get to your answer. To get to the correct answer, you would have had to see from the etymology that the name is made up of tyrant with lizard and king. To get full marks, you would need to include an explanation of each of these root words. In 2013, the focus of the paper was environmental activism. These two texts both refer to activism. In text six, the reader is asked to accept that the killing of animals and the wearing of fur can be both environmentally responsible, even desirable. Text seven highlights the superficial marketing that some companies use to convince consumers that they are environmentally ethical. The question tells you that the two texts are examples of greenwashing as opposed to whitewashing. Candidates are instructed to write a dictionary entry for the word greenwash. Pause the video and do this. You'll be able to compare your answer with the model answer on the next slide.
Did you get all of this? You could have written it as either a verb or a noun. Both are correct as long as your definition and etymology matches the part of speech. Please take note of the detail in this answer and how individual marks are awarded. Twenty fifteen's dictionary question is similar to that of twenty thirteen. Here you have to write a dictionary definition for the word ageism. Please note that in six point two you had to be able to use a derivative of the original word and explain how the suffix indicates what part of speech the word ageist is. You'll agree that this is not a difficult question. I'm sure that all of you would get full marks for this. The last example from a past IEB paper is from 2016. Candidates were asked to read these three tweets and then answer the questions that followed. Pause the video and carefully study the tweets before moving on to the questions. 6a reads as follows. Graduating from two universities means you get double the calls asking for money donations. They get really pushy too. The question tells us that each of the tweets is a humble brag. In order to answer the questions, you need to know the following two terms. Oxymoron and neologism. An oxymoron is when we have two words opposite in meaning next to one another. For example, it was a bittersweet experience when I saw my long-lost cousins at my aunt's funeral. The oxymoron is, of course, bittersweet. In 6.2, you have to write a dictionary entry for humble brag. My students should by now understand why they have to write the weekly Word on Wednesday in dictionary format. You've been practicing for these questions every week. As you have done with the other answers, pause the video here and look at how marks are allocated to each part of the answer. Sometimes you think a question is easy, but when you get your script back, you're disappointed that you didn't get full marks. It's usually because you didn't write your answer systematically, ensuring that you cover every aspect mentioned in the question. I think you're ready to answer some questions yourself. My grade tens, please look at the exercise printed at the end of your lesson plans. You'll spend your last lesson of the week answering questions on this page from a dictionary. Consider it a practice run for the end of year exams. When you've finished, let me know and I'll provide the answers. In other words, the answers won't appear on this video lesson. You'll have to get there by yourselves. My grade 11s, you'll find your exercise at the end of your lesson plans. You have to answer questions on extracts from seven different types of dictionaries. As with the grade 10s, the answers are not on this video. You can get them from me when you've finished.
Thank you for joining me for this revision lesson on dictionary skills. It's a topic we often gloss over as we assume that everyone knows everything about dictionaries. Well, now you do. Please remember to like the video and to subscribe to the channel so that more students can benefit from these online lessons. Goodbye, everyone. Until next time.